Hi all, uh, very good morning, good evening. Thank you so much for joining this uh, webinar. Uh, so today we are going to discuss about one of the very key and an interesting, and it is also a very relevant topic for the day, right? So every organization or the services industry, right? Like, I mean, for them to stay relevant, it is extremely important for them to invest in the digital transformation. Uh, we have the uh, the panelists from um, the healthcare and the airlines industry. So it is extremely important, let's say if you go to an airport, um, so today you are checking or like, I mean, uh, you know, it's completed just by looking at your face. In healthcare industry, uh, there are a lot of transformation initiatives taking place just by, you know, taking the X-ray, like, you know, you'll be able to compare and predict some of the future diseases. So all these are possible mainly because of the uh, the digital transformation that is taking place. Now, in addition to it, A is also like, I mean, it's playing a major role in uh, supporting the IT services industry. Let's say, for example, like, I mean, be it, uh, uh, writing the code, or preparing some meeting minutes. Uh, so A is playing a major role in the transformation initiatives. But these transformation initiatives definitely come with a major uh, security risk, right? For example, if you take AI, uh, if you uh, it can write a vulnerable code for you, or uh, there is a possibility of an LLM poisoning, which can lead to uh, you know uh, completely different uh, inference or can lead to a lot of other legal issues. So in today's webinar, so we have three uh, you know, great leaders here who are here to share how they are able to successfully implement or do the transformation initiatives. And at the same time, making sure like, I mean, uh, all the security controls are taken care of. Let me take a moment to like, you know, introduce our key panelists. Uh, first, we have um, Besa. Uh, Besa is, uh, she's a CAO for Jewish Board. In her current role, uh, Besa leverages her expertise uh, to develop IT infrastructure aligning with strategic objectives. Previously, um, at the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services, she led uh, digitization efforts for a 2.6 billion agency. She played roles like Chief Analytics Officer at uh, Precision Human Services and uh, Chief Data and Compliance Officer at Mercy First. Her background spans in AI, ML, and quality improvement. Next, we have uh, Inder. So Inder is a CAO at Englewood uh, Health, brings in vast expertise in healthcare technology leadership. So he is here its IT initiative, digital transformation, and strategies for health systems, which includes a hospital of in, in 100 location, urgent care, and integrated under one electronic uh, uh, you know, medical record system. Uh, Inder also actively participates in health and technology conferences, contributes to uh, the media and uh, journal, uh, and also like, you know, is playing an advisory uh, for New York HIMSS, uh, and he is also like, I mean, playing a major role in uh, Stillman School of uh, Business. So that's uh, Inder. Thank you so much, Inder. Uh, next, we have uh, JC, uh, JC Padilla. So um, JC is a cybersecurity leader based out of Denver, Colorado. He is focused on IT uh, and uh, cybersecurity services for over 20 years. He's currently a director uh, at Frontier Airlines, and he's there for since 2022. Uh, leading various uh, uh, cybersecurity initiatives and taking care of the various pillars like risk management, cybersecurity operations, identity and access management, and architecture. So he served as a leader in various industries like commercial aviation um, at uh, Spirit Airlines, uh, information security officer at uh, City National Bank, and he also worked in uh, Carnival Cruise. Uh, welcome, panelists. Thank you so much, you know, for taking time to join this uh, uh, webinar. It's really going to be a uh, very, very uh, insightful information to all the participants in the call. Um, let me start with the first question. 
um, maybe I'll uh, Bessa, I want to like to ask you this question in terms of like I mean in your respective in I know the in the industry how IT looks like in in next five years. So what are the future technologies that you are planning to adopt, and how are you aligned to it? So I think, I mean, I wouldn't be amiss if I started talking about AI. Everyone's just sort of in the hyper majority of the hyper cycle right now. Um, we're really looking at many more automations. Our goal and objective, um, just like with Indar, is uh, allowing our physicians, clinicians to be able to do their work. So one of the things that usually tell me is how is this tool going to help me do my job better? Um, less time, less energy. So then I could take that time and spend it with a patient rather than spending it, you know, documenting the interaction. So our goal objective is really to leverage tools, AI being included, robotic process automation, any other sort of support tools to allow our clinicians to spend less time documenting and more time in the patient experience. Um, obviously with that, um, you know, we're talking about cybersecurity. So um, as our healthcare data is expanding, it's becoming much more valuable. Another really big area that we're focusing is really beefing up our um, cybersecurity posture. Um, and healthcare and human services have become a soft target for many, you know, nation state and other actors. So that's another area that we're personally being impacted. And we're seeing the ramifications of not necessarily us, but parties within that healthcare chain that are being severely impacted by um, just many things happening in our ecosphere. Um, so that's another area that how do we ensure that our partners and our third party vendors have a stronger cybersecurity posture. It's easy to sort of cover my home, but I also want to ensure that my next door neighbors and anybody else within the neighborhood also has the same type of posture. Therefore, it limits our exposure as far as rest. So those are a few things that we're currently working on. Great. Um, in that, would you like to share your uh, inputs in terms of like, I mean, how the IT is looking like and uh, what initiatives like, I mean, you are working on? Sure. Um, thank you, Kanan, and, and happy to be here. Welcome to everyone who's participating. Um, so, in next five, 10 years, uh, you know, it's easy to understand where the technology will go, right? And we all are looking at AI, machine learning, quantum computing, more availability of network 5G access. All those are cool things, but I'm going to pick up on where Bessa started really, right? Um, how does it help my users? So a little bit of a background, about 15 years ago, healthcare started in this whole transformation journey of electronic medical record. It came as a government mandate, initially an incentive, then there was, a, there was a penalty of not being digital. And over this period of time, one, we have amassed a lot of digital data, some structured, some unstructured. But what has happened is during this time, we have also burdened our clinicians. We are burdened with clinicians. You know, they are no longer dazzled with, oh, another technology tool, because they worry about another technology tool will add more to my burden. And I think where I want to see this industry go and where I see it going in a little bit uh, of what I've seen over the last one year is to ease that burden, which, you know, as Bessa pointed out, some level of documentation help removing the mundane tasks, removing the administrative tasks from a portfolio of how very highly desirable and compensated resource of a clinician so they can spend more time with the patient uh, versus uh, interacting with the technology. I've always believed and I've always implemented technology as an aid um, or additional tool in the arsenal of clinicians when they're taking care of a patient. Somehow over the last 10, 15 years, this has created a more burden for a clinician in terms of added documentation because all we did was we converted a paper form which was intense to electronic documentation system. And then we're collecting all this data where we have, we have visibility into the data, but not necessarily we have really insights from the data because it's just not humanly possible. So broadly speaking, that's where I see where the effort is now and easing the burden, easing the burden of an average user. We all benefit from some level of AI and machine learning every day. Even somebody reminded me when the spell check which shows up in Microsoft Word or your text messages, is in some form of AI. Uh, it, so it's aiding us, it's abating our, our efforts, 
I just want that to continue both for the front facing clinician as well as the back office operations of healthcare, and which is really with the advancement of all the technologies we are seeing over the last few years. Great. And, and JC would like to share your inputs in terms of like, I mean, how the yeah, I'd like to add to it. I mean, obviously, you got to follow where the money is at, and you look at the big providers, the big tech companies like Google and Microsoft, how they're doing such heavy investment into AI. I mean, AI has been the buzzword across all conferences and whether it's IT or cyber related, it's the big thing, right? They're, they're, they're you know, generative AI, AI, all this new um, <clears throat> large language models and all the new capabilities are coming out of it. Um, you know, the, the Microsoft's investing over $1 billion in, in, in open AI. Google's investing something near like $100 billion over the next few years around AI. I mean, it's it's a big space uh, from an aviation standpoint, commercial aviation standpoint. You mentioned that biometrics is starting to pick up. You've seen uh, borders and custom enforcement. The TSA is starting to use it for global entry purposes and even for standard passport control. Um, that's going to continue to to advance into the, uh, a larger uh, landscape of you know of the traveling public. Um, some airlines have already been very public about what they're using uh, AI for. JetBlue has come out and said that they're going to be leveraging Flyer Labs uh, for improving their revenue management uh, capabilities to keep it more um, operationally efficient and in gaining the uh, customer experience through um, like enhanced data analysis and, and information they're getting from their booking processes and their flight processes. Um, Lufthansa has come out and talked about how they're leveraging it for planning out their flight plans and um, controlling weather better. You know, it's all in the, in the intent of you know, keeping operations running more smoothly, anticipating when storms are coming, anticipating routes that are going to have some impact to weather and be able to better navigate through that. Um, you see Delta doubling down and investing heavily in, in their guest travel experience, uh, making that seamless process from the time of booking uh, pre, uh, you know, before they're actually the day of travel, while you're in travel, in the, in, in the flights with Wi-Fi, really customizing that whole experience with AI. Um, to, to make it a much more um, holistic uh, process. And that really kind of goes the, on that customer experience and has more, um, you know, uh, customer loyalty to the brand and et cetera. At Frontier, we're looking to um, expand on our technology as well, whether it's AI or not. But um, things that we're looking at are enhancing uh, the peripheral nature of, uh, of getting technology on in our uh, basically our agents across the stations, whether they're um, pilots, uh, flight attendants, or their customer service agents and custom gate agents, getting more technology in their hands. Right now, a lot of them are, are subject to lever leveraging a lot of legacy technology uh, with common new stations and terminals that are, you know, 10 plus years old. Um, so the technology is kind of dated, doesn't have a full stack of capabilities like you would see today with Microsoft and those kind of things. So really empowering the ability for them to communicate better with corporate better with their peers, with better across the airport stations to keep operations flowing more efficient, efficiently. Um, so you'll see that we're, we're starting to do some more technology with 5G as well. Um, not, you know, the lead time to open a station can often be between three to six months. And oftentimes business decisions on which stations we're gonna go to could change very quick. Um, you know, it's a day-to-day -day kind of thing. Maybe there's a seasonal opportunity to go to a certain station or open something. And we don't have, we, we can't be afforded a period of three to six months to do that. So we're doing a lot more 5G with mobile providers and getting a lot, a lot more like mobile capabilities that could be put in a box and deployed out to a station and a gate and have an, op an airport operating within a couple of weeks instead of having to wait months to do that. So all things that we're doing in the technology space, there's a ton of things we're doing. Um, AI is at, at the center of it um, as we move forward through this wave of, um, of transformation. Great, great insights, uh, JC. Now, while this is, going to have a major impact, like, I mean, from the end user perspective, right? Like, I mean, it's it's definitely going to have a, a different experience. Let's say if you walk into any provider, uh, like Besan in the rightly said, the the most important thing is like, I mean, you know, how is the, te how the technology is going to improve the, um, the doctor and the patients, uh, the interaction, right? Um, we don't want the, uh, the the computers are like I mean, you know, the robots to just um, you know in, in, interrupt or like I mean, you know, uh, um, they taking the dish right. Like I mean, while yes, they can definitely give the inputs, um, 
we definitely want to have more interactions with the doctors, right? I mean, that, that's exactly what every patient is looking for. And similarly, like, I mean, you know, if I walk into the airport or if I go to an airport, uh, you, you definitely are looking for a better experience. You'll be able to check in fast and, you know, um, able to book your tickets very quickly. Uh, so without, a, you know, any turbulent, uh, you know, a journey and all that. Now, while this is extremely important to give a best end user experience, how do you see some of the technologies like, for example, AI, um, you know, being adopted in your, uh, by your technical team, uh, right? Because the, the, the IT support or like, I mean, your IT team, how these technologies are like, I mean, no impacting them. Uh, maybe I would like to hear from Inder. Sure. I, you know, I think my, my barometer always is the outcomes and the user impact. <clears throat> my technical teams can align themselves uh, to an AI technology, if, and we already have what in our environment today. Um, one other um, um, point to be noted here is most of us in healthcare are not developing these. We are consumer of these technologies developed by vendors, developed by our business partners, developed by our other partners. So, you know, my technical teams need to have, again, the same filter on how does it help my end users? How does it impact my end users? Now, AI has two pieces to it. It expands the concept of end users. You know, up until a few years ago, most of the things we did only affected the users in my control environment, the clinicians, the back office function, the other administrative staff. Uh, but now we are engaging more and more patients in our care. In many ways, you know, healthcare has started getting to where airline got 20 years ago. They allowed patients to book themselves, all the dazzles of booking the tickets in, in a manner, pushed out all the work, engaged their consumers, empowered them, and, and at, it has become a norm. We in healthcare are getting there, like we started getting there like maybe five, seven years ago in allowing you to schedule your appointments, interact with the health system electronically, request your records, those kind of things. So, and that's where we started. That's where we are now are exploring opportunities with AI uh, in this space, consumer engagement, patient engagement, prospective patient engagement, whether it's active communications, whether it's engaging them in their care, whether it's, uh, them interacting with the health system and seeking services, all of this. So my concept of end user certainly expanded to uh, a larger realm where I no longer have the luxury of understanding their workflow and understanding how they interact with the technologies. So that is where I think we are also learning from other industries, how they're interacting with the consumer, because it's the same consumer who is interacting with a bank, booking a ticket, and interacting with a health system. We may be a little more complex than ordering food, but that doesn't change the expectation of a consumer. They still want that ease. So that's really number one thing. Other pieces where AI will help us and is helping us is what I call these are less risky endeavors for a health system, which is right process automation, back office functions, in the revenue cycle space, an automatic generation of denials and appeals letter, which really otherwise humanly a person sits at it, gathers the data from a EMR, gathers other aspect of it and creates a letter. All that could be done because you're going to your source of truth, which is your EMR. So you really, there's no, no real option of adding a data which is not relevant. So these functions we will work on, patient literacy, patient education, uh, all those things we will work on now. I think the real evolution of use of AI in healthcare will happen probably five, seven, eight years later, where we get to more personalized medicine, precision medicine, where we can really impact the diagnosis, the recommendation at a point of care. We're not there yet because you wanted to, you mentioned earlier about, right, the AI models, right? We have to gather that level of confidence in a model that it's not hallucinating, that it is gathering the relevant information. And it's personalizing to you, Kandan, versus personalizing to a large section of population. That's how we're, Medicine is delivered today based on the clinical trials on a control group, and then the same or similar is applied all over. There is definitely a potential to get to that stage where it's personalized for a patient, but that's really five, seven, 10 years down the road. But right now we all are reeling under the burden I talked about, and 
and AI is helping us ease the burden and at the same time engaging patients more in their own care. And, and of course, with, with the remote patient monitoring, with all the yeah. IOTs coming in place, right? I mean, it is definitely, uh, it's going to change the technology landscape. So I would like to hear from you um, in terms of how this is going to impact your the, the IT team. I think our IT team need to be tech translators. We have like, you know, no one's going to build their LLM models the same way that OpenAI is building those. I think we're users and consumers of a lot of those technologies. So for us, it's not building it. And when I hear somebody else says, you know, I'm going to build it, you know, my colleagues at NYU are building it. They're working for these big 10 companies that can leverage billions of dollars like Llama or, you know, um, Google or these companies that can invest heavily in the specific that part of the technology. I think our businesses are so diverse. We're not in the business of creating these models. We're in the business of applied. So in applied science and applied technology, how can I take this um, whatever tool and currently is AI next time it'll be quantum computing, whatever else is in the horizon, you know, and the bleeding edge of technology right now it's that, how can I use that and apply it into practice? I was going to go um, with Enderpo, what you said previously. I think a lot of our, both of our customers, as well as our clinicians, I remember one physician coming to me and basically saying, why can our EHR be more like my iPhone? And I'm like, well, I wish, you know, the EHR was similar to Apple. They could build that user interface. And that's the same thing with Juan in your world. I think the user experience is becoming very much homogenous across the board. Everyone mm -hmm. wants that iPhone experience. I know my kids don't want anything but the iPhone experience. They want the ease of use to be able to do things and be very intuitive. So they want intelligent systems, intelligent machines. They can intuit, I want to book a flight. My daughter actually works for JetBlue. So I've seen the, you know, the advancements in technology there. Um, they want that user experience, but both on the customer side, which is demanding it, but also a lot of, you know, we have younger generation physicians and clinicians. They're digital natives. They've grown up with a lot of this. So they want these legacy systems to behave more like the systems they're very comfortable with. So it's creating um, this revolution within healthcare, I think, to digitize, modernize, really look at these systems and how do we automate um, burden of work? Um, they don't want to work the same way. They want things to be automated. So I think a lot of these systems where we could apply, where my team is doing quite a lot of work, is on the back end trying to automate a lot of the functions on the UX, UI, the front end, the user interface, making it easy when our, with our patient portals, making it easy for our end users. And I agree that I think our base is not just us, it's not our leadership, it's not our staff, it's expanded to our patients, our clients, our community. So it's a long ecosystem that we have to deal with. And our system have to be very flexible and reactive to that, which in the past it wasn't. A lot of the systems were set for a function. They were set for a role. And now they are they need to be elastic to deal with multifunctions, which, you know, we're reeling with, you know. So we're, we're having a few challenges there. And JC, I mean, I know with, with airlines, right? Like, I mean, because uh, you depend more on the, the end users, right? Like, I mean, millions of them, like, I mean, uh, you know, trying to connect each and every day, trying to put their tickets. So how is this technology landscape, you know, um, it's going to impact you or what is your IT team should be prepared to handle? Yeah, so our business is going to obviously have an eye on how we um, manage the technology to help boost revenue growth while enhancing that customer experience. Some, so the organization is working on two major work streams and pushes around um, uh, how to adopt a, you know, this modernization of AI and technology. And the big thing is around customer care and the improved customer experience. The organization took a, a leap back last year and, and probably with some more data technology that's not as uh, robust as it is today. But you know, Frontier was one, one of the pioneers that we, we said that we could handle um, all the volume of calls coming into our contact center, which is a basically a customer service uh, for our passengers, um, that we can basically have our chatbots handle all that volume. And we doubled down on that. So like late last year, like in Q Q3, Q4, we, um, we actually um, suspended our hotline. And we doubled down on the fact that our chatbot on our website would be able to handle all 
uh, day of travel, booking issues, um, refunds, et cetera, all that via a chatbot process. Now, you know, most of it will be handled by a chatbot, and at some point it will be escalated to a, a back-end agent that's actually working it. But really limiting that customer engagement between a human to human. It was really human to uh, a chatbot. And uh, we kind of fell on our face on that. Like we were not successful down that path. Uh, I don't know if the algorithms were as advanced as they needed to be, or they had all the uh, the full robust catalog of features that we needed. Uh, but it came to a point where we we, we kind of came back from that. And we actually opened up our hotline again, and we're working on our, our second iteration of all, what that chatbot is going to look like. And we're planning to get it right this time uh, to really do much more expansive uh, deployment of it. So much better virtual assistant, more 24 by 7, more dialogue as opposed to just being all text-based, um, supporting multiple channels via phone and also chat, um, and also providing this technology not only to the to the consumer, but also to the back-end agents that need it for notes or customer sentiments and see how things are going to really leverage and close the loop on, on that total customer experience process. And we're not only doing this for more of the customer kind of uh, service kind of aspects, but really for that quality management, that workforce management, uh, forecasting, scheduling, staffing, agent quality, all that stuff regarding our customer contact center, um, that whole ecosystem around that department is really uh, leveraging, has projects to, to leverage that technology. Um, and so we're, we're really excited what the next six months um, brings uh, for Frontier and our customer service and experience around it. Another area that we're looking to focus in is around marketing and brand promotions. So really getting the whole tailored content process, right? So at the time of booking, when uh, customers are looking and perusing like different flight paths and routes, really bringing more, um, more kind of holistic input from social media sentiment, from other marketing campaigns, prior travel, uh, prior experiences, just bringing all that data together to really bring a more tailored content over to the customer. So, uh, you know, they feel better about their buying and it's actually very robust and it covers multiple things, not just flight. It could include hotel and cars and other excursions, those kind of, kind of things. So really making a great customer experience as they go off on their trips um, and really monitoring social media and outlets and those kind of things. You know, as we, as we dabble into the space of, you know, bringing more tech and getting more data and analyzing things, I mean, we have to make sure that the experience is good. We don't want to have an, another, another experience where we back away from technology we've done and work over revert back to more manual methods of doing things. Uh, we want to make sure that we approach these things, we, we do it so it's good for the customer. Um, and we we'll also have to be very cautious, right? Like as we bring in technology, like I said, we, we don't build a lot of the stuff. We are more, we apply things that are being provided or kind of industry best, you know, tools and platforms. But we have to work with partners that are strategic in the space and are dedicated to it and have, you know, passenger data and privacy at the top of mind. You know, yeah. so that's where the cybersecurity component elements come in. We don't make sure that they're good stewards with their data and they have good policies and contractual language and agreements so that we're not we're not exposing our customer data to, um, you know, vendors that are fly by the night or they're reselling our data and those kind of things that we have to be very worried about uh, in this day of age where data privacy is, you know, very top of mind for the consumer and they can push uh, customers over to another vendor or another provider. So great, um, great yeah. points, uh, uh, JC, right? Like, I mean, in a nutshell, right? Um, some of the key things that is coming out are like, I mean, one, specific or like, I mean, individual, uh, you know, um, um, uh, targeting a particular individual and giving the, uh, uh, say, from the provider perspective, right? like, I mean, giving the right level of uh, support. Usability is very, very key, right? I mean, Besa clearly mentioned about like, I mean, uh, iPhone, like a uh, interface. And you also touched upon uh, uh, how usability is so key. Um, and giving the right or like, I mean, all the inference, which is really relevant to the backend and the uh, the end users. While the technical or like, I mean, the, the technology transformation is really key, right? It really changes the uh, security uh, landscape, right? Like, I mean, your threat vectors and everything is going to change. So what is your view in terms of like, I mean, how the threat landscape is going to look like in near future with the adoption of all these new technologies and like i mean if you're working on any new transformation it definitely comes with a lot of security risks so how do you number one like i mean identify the security risks in your respective organizations and uh, what measures you know that you have put in place to uh, 
to make sure like i mean these uh, security risks are addressed maybe i would like to hear from you jc uh, in terms of like i mean what are the risks that you foresee yeah i think when you approach technology vendors vendors in, in general i mean you have to have a strong uh, partnership with the business to be at the table and those conversations are having happening and you want to you want to make sure you're there early you're not there at the end of uh, uh of, the, of the acquisition the procurement the design development you want to make sure you're there early so you can ensure you're setting those ethical boundaries on how we're leveraging technology and all this new emerging technology um if you engage with vendors make sure that they're um, ethical vendors and they're following frameworks and uh the, con the contracts that you're engaging with um, are vetted by legal, are vetted by your vendor risk management team, vetted, vetted by cybersecurity, and that you have the right clauses within the agreement to ensure that data privacy, the, the restrictions of data selling, the, the notification breach clauses, um, the identification clauses, all those kind of things that you need to have in standard contracts. These, these vendors are no, uh, no exception to it. You got to continue to have that enforcement and start thinking about new things from a contractual standpoint. You want to make sure you're enforcing with these vendors. Um, uh, and, and just really do an evaluation, do your due diligence as a cybersecurity um, team um, as you're adopting that technology, you know, get in early, evaluate the vendor from more things that, you know, how, how the background of that vendor is, but really the, the technology they're introducing, how that's being vetted. And don't just take their word for it as things are being developed in your environment, make sure that there's certain stage gates where you're involved to be able to properly assess that, that technology as it's going live, whether it's just going to be uh, exposed to our internal user base, or if it's going to be exposed externally to our consumers, uh, make sure you're doing the proper due diligence because um, oftentimes corners are going to get cut, development timelines are are going to get more aggressive. The business is going to want demand feature sets early, and and security oftentimes is going to get skipped and circumvented. So you want to make sure you're you're a stage gate, you're a sign off, and you're getting your you know your processes approved, um, and really just you know getting, being there and doing the ongoing monitoring for the vendor. And do risk assessments, right? Like if this technology is dealing and interacting with a lot of the data that's sensitive in nature, you know, you want to rank that higher in your vendor risk scoring and make that critical. So you will revisit that vendor on a more recurring basis. Oh, you're on mute, Khan. Uh, thank you, JC. Thank you so much. And uh, Besa, I would like to hear from you in terms of uh, how the threat landscape is changing, what measures like I mean you are planning to put in place? I think the key step is being aware of the you know ever changing threat landscape in healthcare. Um, we are a soft target for nation state actors. Um, recently, we had a pretty large cybersecurity breach with Change Healthcare that actually impacted us in our claims. Um, and I keep getting notifications along my if you were you know. Any, you know, Aetna or United Healthcare or a lot of the insurances are tied together. Um, we're um, they're up the chain, we're down the chain as far as providing services, but it wasn't even us, you know. But in a way, the healthcare ecosystem is so intertwined. Um, just being aware of not only I could have the greatest cybersecurity posture, I could lay on that Swiss cheese and have multiple different kind of fill the goal, you know, the gaps with multiple different applications. The problem is as soon as that data goes out and gets processed through a central clearinghouse, um, as far as claims, that's another sort of the insurance and other folks that take that data and move it up the chain for the payment processing. And that this is where it happened. It wasn't even with change. It was with another vendor to that vendor. So looking at that vendor risk and that chain is gonna be really important. Um, I mean, this was a nation state as attack. Um, anyway, we're, we're seeing many more of that. So that's why I started off in the beginning saying, it's not just ensuring that my cybersecurity po posture is awesome. I wanna ensure that Interpols is you know, awesome because we refer clients there. So I wanna ensure that his you know, uh, system, if we're gonna you know, uh, share messages or if I do referrals, my patient to you know, another hospital system, that that data is secure, along with ensuring that if it gets processed, that that is also secure. The entire pathway needs to be secure. Um, so for us is really different type of advocacy, working with our partners across the ecosystem within healthcare, trying to figure out how can we collaborate and work together? How can we leverage the power of you know, coming together 
to ensure that our entire network is secure because you know, you're only as good as your weakest link. And we found out fairly quickly that our weakest link impacted all of our systems. We had to pivot within three months because we couldn't provide services. It was a real time. It wasn't even, you know, sort of like a tabletop exercise. It was a, a real time exercise where we had to pivot within a week or so to ensure that the disruption of services um, didn't happen. And we're gonna see much more of that. We're actually seeing much more of that. Um, but I'm going to sort of um, say the same thing as Juan uh, said, you know, prior, ensuring that the the partners that we partner with also, um, you know, have the latest and greatest technology. I was listening to a podcast recently that with AI and now with quantum computing, computing, cryptography might just go out the window. Cryptography is what makes all of us secure as far as the internet. If you're going to shop, right? Everything is kind of put in an envelope locked and then the, you know, the key from the vendor to unlock it and vice versa. The whole trusted network might fall apart. Um, that's sort of like the scary doomsday scenario. I'm not that far down the line, but with a lot of these technologies, there's pros and cons, and we're seeing that in our ecosystem right now. Very valid points, uh, Besa, right? I mean, I, like you rightly said, what we thought will take years for somebody to crack and uh, you know to to identify your password, so it takes it just needs some minutes to do it now, right? Like I mean, it's quantum computing and all. That. So, in that, would like to hear from you in terms of like I mean, what what security challenges you see and what should um, your team or how the organization should be prepared and able to handle this uh, in that. <clears throat> Broadly speaking, we are shifting from cybersecurity as a tool-based and, and a method-based process to organization-wide um, awareness, right, at a high level. Uh, but from a, from a pure cybersecurity 101 perspective, we need to have all those things in place which, which were really um, aspirational in the past, right? your perimeter security, your vulnerability management program, patching program, all of those, assuming everything is in place. Now with, with the advancement in computing, machine learning and AI, I think we are deal we're gonna be dealing with very different level of threats. You know, one area I see, which all of us probably are experiencing in organization is really an ability to create deep fakes, audios, videos, smishing campaigns, um, they can really impersonate much easier and get sophisticated around it. Um, vulnerability management, we all, you know, are, even though you run a squeaky clean program, right? There are zero day threats which show up every now and then. It gives us team some time, zero day means zero day, but you still try to do it within a few hours. Think about that vulnerability now be exploited by a machine learning algorithm. Discovering that zero day before we can even be notified and cracking it, very much possible. Yeah. A malware, which is really adaptive and dynamically changing its behavior. These are all really not science fiction things. These are all very much possible with AI. Uh, DDoS uh, attacks or any other way to overwhelm our defenses because there is so much compute power behind it. And of course, you know, uh, personalized attack really uh, whether it's a phishing campaign, not, not, no longer it's a free coffee thing, it's really targeting individual users because everyone has like maybe 300 points of data about every single member of the organization, right? So where, where does it, this is all not doom and gloom, we can probably use the, you know, the, the same as an antidote. And that's where AI will come to its own defenses, right? Uh, anomaly detection. Today, we, we work on really a lot of patterns uh, but humanly, we can only uh, manage so much data. Yes, we have algorithms running. We're trying to identify the, the risk stratification of each vulnerability, but maybe there is more than that. And, you know, we're, again, so we can use, harness the same compute for anomaly detection. We're harnessing the same compute for our SIM. No longer is our SIM really rule-based because how many rules can we define? You know, my goal with that is that the, the SIM vendor and the product is consistently learning and enhancing the defenses. Malware analysis, again, all this is again possible if, if tools come in market utilizing the same technology which is being utilized to exploit us, I see that's where we will be there. And, and, and it's changing very quickly. And again, I say, 
A lot of these are person-based attacks because we all have done great job in, in spam filtering and perimeter defenses. So, you know, no longer those kind of cyber attacks are happening. They are either, if we missed on, on 101, like changed it with, with a two-factor authentication or, a, or through users. Most of them are happening through inside users clicking on something wrong or, or performing an action. So I think that education needs to be an ingrained thing going forward. Yeah, amazing points. Uh, so before I open the floor for Q and A, right? Like, I mean, I have a. Let me start with my question, right? Uh, so this being a cybersecurity awareness month, uh, it is extremely important. Like, I mean, we impart that the awareness and the training to the team. Um, what? Um, so, so how how are you educating your team? And like Bessa also, like I mean, brought in a very very important point, right? Like I mean, you all, it's not just enough if you just train your team. You also have to make sure your uh, third parties managing your system should also have the adequate security controls, and they should also be trained. So, how are you taking care of this, uh, Bessa? You want to start? Oh, sure. I mean, for us, we. Um... We did a pretty interesting tabletop exercise last month. Uh, we're doing a whole bunch of cybersecurity awareness for this month. Um, and I'm taking advantage to do webinars and many other sort of training podcasts. And it's, you know, it's something that I want to make it very personal to our users. I'm sure they've experienced similar types of, you know, SMS types of messages, uh, different types of attacks. Um, so this is not something that outside, I think a lot of our users are feeling that they're feeling the ramifications of these technologies and they're tar being targeted individually. So what can they do? Um, and we're trying to ensure that um, we make it very easy for them to consume this information and also make it actionable. I think that's a lot of the cybersecurity training is there. It's like, it's gloom and doom. Oh my God, look, this is the scary stuff that's out there. But I think for our users, one of the, the feedback was that, what can we do? How can we ensure that I am safe? And it usually starts with what's in it for me. Um, so as long as we target what's in it for them and how can they make their lives more secure along with their families, then it's a different sort of adoption. A lot of, a lot of our cybersecurity um, applications, you know, we implemented MFA across the board, um, duplicate, tri triplet sort of, um, assessments to ensure that you are who you are. Um, and that takes time, but they understand there's a cost and benefit to that. So the benefit is that there, you know, we know that um, we're designing systems that can be trusted, you know, as much as, you know, trust can happen these days. But on the other side, they, because of the training, they understand that this is part of parcel of doing business. So there's always that cost benefit of time and energy. Um, Training is key and ensuring that it's consistent. So it's not just for one month, but it's throughout the year as well. Amazing. And, and JC, in, in the case of airlines, right? I mean, it goes even beyond, right? Because uh, it involves your users, right? Um, so how are you educating your end users? So, yeah, this multi-pronged, multi-faceted um, way we approach awareness and training. Um, like Bessa mentioned, tabletop exercise is a great way of bringing those team members that are going to be involved in an incident, whether they're technical or a little bit more expanded outside of the technical team that have a, more of a leadership function or a risk management function. Um, you know, stakeholders within the business that have uh, interacting or dealing like communications, HR, uh, legal, uh, all those stakeholders, really bringing them to the table and working on like real life kind of like scenarios that would happen. Like what if, you know, a, kind of a doomsday example of something would happen that implies both uh, flight operations and also has a back end issue to, to our to our systems taking us down and causing a, a major like you know data leak issue where now we're at, um, you know they are our client our customers data has been basically compromised so how do we deal with from uh, business um, operations uh, restoring that component to it and how do you deal with the the, uh, the damage control for uh, managing all the the data records that have been compromised so really bringing, bringing team members that are across the organization to work through those really tough issues um, is a great way to uh, advocate for awareness and training and understand where the gaps are and what our processes are lacking so we can uh, improve those. So next go around, um, we can do it a little better or if something will actually manifest itself, 
they were well prepared to handle it. We do a lot of the computer-based training and we try to break it up twice a year and smaller. One of the biggest complaints we get is training is too long. It's, you know, it's not really relevant. Um, I'm just, you know, you were spending over an hour doing it and with just a lot of complaints, right? And uh, oftentimes you just wanna make sure you have um, good content that can really resonate well with the, with the user. And it's things that maybe they do at the office, but definitely do at home and kind of really bring all those kind of concepts both at home and office into the into the curriculum and make it shorter and then break it up twice a year. That's what we do. We just do like 20 to 25 minute um, campaigns um, for awareness training that have to do it twice a year. So it stays top of mind and it's short and it's not so much of a cumbersome thing. And uh, we're getting a lot more adoption around that. Um, obviously always doing the phishing campaigns, um, making users aware of what to look out for in an email. Um, and also sharing resorts back with the user base, like, hey, we didn't fare so well this quarter or this month, um, let's try to improve on it. And these are the kind of things to look out for. So reinforcing that constantly. And then what we do in October for Awareness Month is really a lot of um, awareness, video outreaches with our executive teams. We put it out to our um, to our team members over Teams and email. And uh, we host an events to just really get our, our biggest vendors to come on um, to sponsor. And, you know, I have like food, like prizes, like trivia, different things that gets uh, team members kind of excited when they come into the office and just keep security at top of mind and helps them get a little bit aware of some of the technology that they interact with on a day-to-day -day basis on why maybe we block websites they go to or we block thumb drives and have some of those vendors here and they can kind of ask questions or just know that there's a presence of cybersecurity here. And more than anything, we're making them aware who we are. And so if something does happen, there are eyes and ears to reach out to us and what the contact information is to reach out to us. Because the faster we can respond to something, the, the less impact it's going to have to our team and our organization. Uh, so it's really about getting the word out, knowing who we are and stuff. Great, great insights, uh, JC. So mm -hmm. the first question is, um, with the adoption of new technologies like IoT, AI, uh, and uh, you know the analytics, we clearly see a risk in, um, you know, uh, uh, there is a possibility of attack at any, any given point of time because of the threat uh, uh, exposure, right? So what is the role of uh, the DR and, you know, how resilient, you know, are the organization? What is that, you know, they need to do to make it more resilient? Uh, Inder would like to hear from you. So I, I think what, you, you mentioned about IOTs and I'll, I'll add variables on top of it, right? Um, so the key piece here is all of these are generating data, which is, which is, which is part of my enterprise data landscape. Uh, so patient variables, um, they carry PHI, which get transformed into my electronic record. Uh, I need to ensure that, that the data is encrypted and safe during transit while at the device and of course with me. This is where you know, the third party risk management comes in play in full force because you are relying on a third party to deliver that important piece of data for us. In case of IOTs, I would say it's, you know, a lot of the IOTs exist within my environment. So I can probably take little comfort with the perimeter security, but I just want to make sure that they are not communicating outside in the outside of the organization unless specifically permitted to do so. And, and, and I give an example with the tool I have in place today, which actively scans my environment uh, for medical devices. And it, it and it allows me an ability that if any unauthorized device gets connected in my environment, I immediately get notified of it and can act on it. So I think that's where we need to be. There's no longer, of course, you know, the TVM program, everything is turning into an active scanning. Again, a lot of compute resources, but also a lot of uh, kind of burden on all of our endpoints. But I don't see a way out of it. So it's all about really active scanning and acting in the minutes, because what I answered last was that there, there are tools and processes and bad actors out there who now have an ability to exploit any vulnerability they may create within minutes, right? So I, I just need to be more vigilant on that. Great, great in there. And, and Besa, from your point of view, like, I mean, um, how are you making sure, like, I mean, or what kind of uh, controls are put in place to uh, make it more resilient? 
I mean, as Andrew said and JC, it's vendor risk management, um, what we can control within our environment, ensuring that um, the applications that we have, um, whatever cybersecurity application you have in your environment is optimized and they're layered appropriately because not any one application does everything. So unfortunately, you will have different types of applications do different things, but ensuring that all of those applications work in tandem as well as ensuring they're optimized to, you know, uh, to ensure that there is no vulnerabilities. I think both of those things are key components. And um, just continuous monitoring, that's sort of uh, the current um, landscape that we're in, that ensuring that there is no threat actors, but continuous monitoring and that risk mitigation, I think is really key. Great, great insights. Uh, next question is, uh... We clearly see the risk, right? Like, I mean, so what is um our our what do you like the, the future, like I mean, look, the compliance requirements that are going to come in and uh, how organizations should be ready uh, to face those requirements or uh, so would like to hear from you, JC, in terms of like, I mean, what are the future compliance requirements you know, that are going to come in? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, like you've seen the SEC come out with new guidelines like earlier. I um, mean, last year, um, the TSA, from from our perspective, is starting to ramp up on making sure there's certain control sets applied to critical infrastructure because we're critical infrastructure in the aviation space. So airports and airlines in the United States are subject to uh, um, some additional regulations outside of SOX. So, I mean, you just got to stay on top of the regulations. Regulations have good intent and spirit of what they're trying to do, um, but oftentimes it, they, um, they go pretty wide on controls and don't go very deep. So you have to mix between what the, the spirit of the regulations are and what they're, the frameworks they're trying to develop and what the actual risk that you're trying to mitigate and um, make sure you're addressing both. Um, obviously, you want to make sure you have strong uh, interpretation of those frameworks uh, and those guidelines and making sure you're applying it to your organization. So, um, yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of more um, kind of emerging technology coming with AI. There's not a lot of framework or, uh, around that just yet, but really staying in tune on the research that happens making sure we're on top of it and we can adopt that um, and, 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 and really just optimizing our systems as that comes and happens, right? A, A, IoT is a big area um, that's kind of like non-traditional technology that we're being, you know, from a technology standpoint, we're, 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 we're supporting it, we're trying to harness it and, and support it, but it's very different from what the typical teams that manage systems and endpoints have to manage. So um, you potentially need to evaluate staffing if, you know, there's a new need to get uh, and and um, in, uh, onboard resources that can focus on that technology. Um, I know like airports and some of, of those kind of uh, providers, they're having to do a lot of safeguards around baggage systems and fueling farms and how they handle that. And that's really much out of the wheelhouse for, you know, your engineers and architects, you know, so oftentimes you need to build up a whole new business unit within your organization that's really focused on that non-traditional technology and how to secure it keeping it isolated from the IT side, keeping it segmented and just managing uh, if, you know, there's frameworks that exist or developing in-house frameworks that can, can, can bring in a lot of the best practices from the IT side and implement it on the IoT side. So it's just a, you know, it's multifaceted um, people, training and processes um, and adhering to frameworks around it to make sure you can harden and keep those environments at low risk. Great, great, JC. And um, in that, because you also like, I mean, part of the uh, the hymns and other, uh, uh, you, you participate in multiple forums, right? Uh, do you see any, uh, you know, what is it? What are the new compliance, you know, requirements, or do you see any new law that is going to come up? The new ones have come uh, out, and they're. Oh, sorry, go but, over. No, uh, go ahead. Finish the thought. No, I was going to say that the new ones that have come out, the SEC has a lot of requirements for uh, reporting it's, and guidelines, you know, incidents, do AKs, uh, really more robust risk assessment processes and correct. risk reporting for both to your board, to your leadership, and also to uh, the public community. So SEC has come out with new guidelines for 10K re releases, and, you know, the TSA has come out with um, um, several different areas around vulnerability, um, access controls around critical systems. So. That those are new emerging uh, requirements and compliance that we're having to, to meet. And obviously, a lot, a lot of the uh, state and federal uh, data privacy requirements that are coming out for opt to uh, to be forgotten, um, consent, uh, you know, for cookies and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of different um, areas that are coming out with new regulations. Great, 
Thanks, thanks, uh, JC. Uh, in the uh, sorry. Uh, okay. So, um, I I would probably say something controversial here, but uh, the, a lot of these regulatory requirements or even the guidelines coming out of state and federal are really kind of covering the basics in my mind. I looked at New York State because New York State last year came up with this and there was funding associated with it to help, especially health healthcare facilities, um, you know, get to a level of maturity in cyber defense. And I think a lot of those things are, are kind of basic things we all need to have in place, but there are probably organizations don't have it. So absolutely a good thing to do for there. Um, we, so my the controversial part is that in the end, some guidelines may come which will add more documentary and compliance burden for us. Uh, but where we need is government to intervene and, and consider this as a national security risk, not just left to all of us, right? And that is that was evident with change healthcare attack that it had ramifications across the country and across the institutions. Uh, so New Jersey is enacting there is a bill in, in the New Jersey State Senate, uh, which really adds more regulatory burden on us, but I'm not sure if it is helping me be more secure. Where a government can help and, and be more secure is, is to do more in terms of global cybersecurity. Yeah, thanks, thanks Inder. And and I would like to hear from you in terms of like, I mean, how governments can help you, right? I mean, uh, I know, uh, uh, you know, they are helping, but, but what more they can do? from your perspective. So I agree with Ender. I think, I mean, I worked for the state, I've worked for the federal government. I've, I've seen the inner workings of those two systems. Um, I think they, they could do a little bit more on the national cybersecurity front. Um, national Institute of Standard Technology came up with their cybersecurity 2.0 slash whatever new version, ISO has their own. Um, I think what we're seeing is the United Healthcare, the change healthcare attack was a nation state attack. It was sort of um, Russian back attack by Black Hat. That, I mean, the target of that was really to disrupt the entire healthcare system. And it did. I think, you know, over 200 million records were exposed, including um, different types of national data sets that were exposed recently as well. Um, those are attacks are happening upstream, they're having impacts across systems. So I agree with Ender. I think the, the state and the federal government can do much more to beef up their cybersecurity posture and build a unified framework that we could all, you know, kind of piggyback on rather than this hodgepodge of everybody kind of securing their neighborhood, but no one's really watching the entire neighborhood or the country. Um, so I think, I mean, the change and sort of much more focus related, how can we do this at a national level or at a state level? I think it's much more important than all of us trying to do this individually. Great, great insights. And we are at the top of the hour. I keep getting few more questions, but I'll make sure uh, you know we capture those questions and respond back to the uh, the users. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, you know, Vesa, Inder, and uh, JC for joining this webinar. Very, very valuable insights, and your inputs are definitely going to help not just this group. Like I mean, also like I mean, other uh, people who are watching this webinar. It's going to help them in terms of like, I mean, what they should do in their respective organizations. How are they? Because change is inevitable. You have to adopt the newer technologies, right? Like, I mean, be it AI or IoT, or any any new uh, uh, transformation, you have to adopt, right? To for you to stay relevant in the uh, in the industry. So at the same time like i mean you know uh, whatever the inputs and the the, uh, the sh you shared from the security perspective it's definitely going to help them and i'm sure uh, you know with with uh, your valuable insight like i mean they'll be able to secure their 